Uh, welcome to the fifth installment of this, the webinar series from Chagas Care in Sligo, Leitrim, Donegal. Uh, my name is Keelan Condon. Condon, I'm a dry stock advisor with uh, in the Manor Hamilton office in County Leitrim. And tonight, the focus moves to the nitrates derogation, uh, which has huge implications for daily farm practices on many farms around the country. Um, the particular importance of tonight's webinar is that my colleagues will be covering the new changes that are due to come into effect in 2021. Um, tonight, I'm joined by Ian Devaney from Chagas in Ballymoat and by Paddy Brown from Chagas in Bally Buffet. And they'll be covering the nitrates derogation itself, the new rules that are due to come in in 2021, and how this will affect farms at ground level. Um, as always, we want to keep things fairly interactive. And at the bottom of your screen, you will see a question and answer function. Um, so you can send your questions through here at any stage across the two presentations from Kian and from Paddy, and I will put them to the panel then. We will have some time for question, questions before we finish. Um, so that's about it for the moment. I will pass you straight on to my colleague Kian Devani if you want to share your screen, Kian, and we will move straight ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Kian Devani is my name. I'm dairy advisor based here in Sligo. Uh, Leitrim, um, based in the Ballymote office. So tonight's topic is based around the derogation changes between 20 and 21. So there's been a significant number of changes over the last year and going into next year in particular, there's going to be more. So myself and Paddy Brown, um, over the next 45 minutes or so, are going to run through these and hopefully give you a better insight into what's coming down the line and how it's going to affect your farm and your business going forward. So just as a quick introduction as to what we're going to cover, um, we, we, I have 12 bullet points here. So I'm going to cover the first five bullet points and then Paddy is going to come, on, come along and cover the next six. And then at the end, I'm going to come back in and cover the last one. So just to give you an idea of what we're going to discuss this evening, I'm going to start off um, covering low emission slurry spreading and the implications of that. I'm going to then move to clover inclusion in the grass seed mixture. Uh, move on then and discuss the grassland management practices. Then I'm going to move to the reduced crude protein for animals uh, over two years of age at grass, and then prevention of direct discharge from the farm roadways. Paddy is then going to discuss the compulsory lineman program and um, the compulsory environmental training, the improved farm biodiversity, and the exclusion of commonages and rough grazing, the setback distances from supplementary drinking points and the exclusions of bovine from water courses. And then finally, when we have all them covered, I'm going to come back on and I'm going to discuss um, how farmers who are currently out of derogation, but maybe exceeding the 170 kilos of nitrogen per hectare um, are, going to be, are going to have affected from 2021 going forward. So to start tonight, I'm going to cover low emission slurry spreading also known as LESS, less. So it's been slowly introduced over the last two years for farmers in derogation, but as of the 15th of April this year, um, all slurry produced on derogation farms now must be spread using LESS equipment. So for farmers, what does that mean? Basically, it means that um, going forward, they either have to have LESS equipment on their farm. So there has been grant aids through TAMS to facilitate this. And there's also the option there to use a contractor. So basically any farmer who is in derogation must either have evidence whereby they have the machinery on the farm or they have a receipt to prove that their contractor has spread their slurry in a suitable manner. And the volumes must be recorded on their annual, uh, on their annual records when doing their derogation records at the end of each year. There's a number of benefits to using LESS equipment and I'm gonna talk about them in the next two slides. So low emission slurry spreading. Basically, this we have three options here. So your conventional splash plate is what we've all been used to for the last long number of years. And we've now come in with three new developments. These include the trail and shoe, which you see here, your dribble bar, and also slurry injection. So the three options available to farmers have different benefits and some are more beneficial than others. So I suppose this diagram or this graph here explains basically the difference between the three. So if we start on the left-hand side, we see our splash plate and 
basically what that has been doing over the last number of years is we've been placing the slurry on the top of the grass, as you can see here. And we, we've been covering the grass basically with slurry and we've been relying then on the nutrients to be washed down into the plant and into the roots, basically. Um, I suppose your, your dribble bar then is just slightly more advanced. We're placing the slurry in lines or in rows. Again, it's at the top of the grass. We're not injecting into the ground or anything, but we are getting it that bit closer to the roots. And the closer we get it to the roots, the better nitrogen uptake we have and the less losses we have. This is particularly evident during the summer months, and we'll discuss that as we go on here further. The third, or the third option here is your trail and shoe. And again, you can see from the graph, it's basically placing the slurry slightly closer to the plant root and below the leaf. Now there is other benefits to this, which we will discuss in a minute. And finally, something that's not that common in Ireland, but has been used on the continent and in other countries is the injection of slurry. And that's actually injecting the slurry below, below the grass and in, into the roots. And again, we're just getting it closer and closer to the roots. And obviously, as we move across there, you can see we're getting down further, further to the roots each time. So just to give you an example of the benefits on farm to this. So we take our thousand gallons of slurry. And again, this is 7% dry matter cattle slurry. There will be variations on farms depending on the levels of dairy washings and so on and so forth that might be going into slurry tanks. But we'll take our thousand gallons of 7% slurry using our splash plate, which was the common practice up until this year. And we were basically getting six units of nitrogen from this in the spring, which was a cooler time of the year and better nitrogen uptake. And then as we move towards the summer, this has been reduced to three units. OK, you can see then as we move across, depending on the method of use, there's very little difference between the dribble bar and the trail and shoe. Um, they're similar, but again, they're 100 percent more efficient in the summer months compared to the splash plate. So we're moving from three units of nitrogen in the summer to six units with either the splash or with either the dribble bar or the trail and shoe. But as we move down, then you can see the use of slurry injection. We're moving from three units of nitrogen from your splash plate up to nine units with your slurry injection. So it's a 200 percent increase. Of, slurry, of, of nitrogen efficiency um, with your injection system. So that's just a couple of the benefits there to using this technology. <clears throat> I suppose another benefit, and it's something that farmers are seeing now as this, as this technology is brought out into farms, is the reduced grass contamination. So I hope you can see them pictures there, but basically, what we were doing before this, we were going out, we were trying to apply our slurry on bare paddocks or maybe after first cut silage. And it was giving us a limited window as to when we could apply slurry without contaminating grass. I suppose as we moved on now, you can see here the dribble bar is placing the slurry in rows and it's reducing the contamination in the grass around it. So it's allowing us to go into paddocks that maybe are grazed five, six, seven days and get slurry on them. And you can see here again, the trail and shoe, significant difference there between the trail and shoe and the dribble bar with getting the slurry just below the grass leaf. And again, reducing the contamination of the grass, meaning a quicker turnaround and getting us back onto those paddocks that bit quicker. So you can just see here from the graph. So the effects of the pre-grazing cover based on the different systems. So obviously you're no slurry, we're getting roughly down to 100 kilos of dry matter per hectare. So that's your ideal post grazing cover. Your trail and shoe, nearly very similar, 200. And then as we move up the graph, your dribble bar in or around 350, 400, and then your splash plate, 600, which is a significant amount of grass left behind. So not really suitable for applying on paddocks that you intend grazing on maybe a 20 or 21 day rotation. So another very important point, and I suppose it's an option that's been created now with the use of this technology, is getting slurry back onto paddocks where we've removed surplus bales. And I suppose many dairy farmers would have realized this in the last number of years, whereby their grassland management has improved and they're taking more and more surplus paddocks out. But at the same time, they're seeing um, a reduction in P and K indexes on these paddocks 
from the removal of bales and not going back out with slurry because obviously they're operating a tight rotation, maybe 18, 20 days in a high growth period, and it's not allowing them to get out with slurry. So I think the introduction of less is going to allow this and it's going to allow farmers to get P and K back onto these paddocks. So I just put up this graph just to give you an idea. I think it's very, it's very straightforward one to have in your head. So if you're removing basically four bales per acre, which quite a, a low cut or a light cut, a lot of people would say it's only the lawn clippings nearly, you're removing 40 units of K from that paddock. So going back out with pasture swart or a low compound, you're not meeting your requirement there and you're quickly going to deplete your indexes, uh, particularly for K, but also for P. You can see there are six and a half units of P per acre removed there with four bales. So that's only a 2000 cover. So not much over what we would be grazing, your 14, 1500s. So a significant amount of P and K being removed there when we're taking off these surplus bales. Second topic I'm going to cover this evening, and it's clover inclusion in grass seed mixtures. So again, from the 1st of January, 2020, this has been compulsory on derogation farms. So all grass seed mixtures used on derogation farms must now include 1.5 kilos of naked clover per hectare. So that's roughly 0.6 of a kilo per acre. Alternatively, 2.5 kilos of pelleted clover can also be used. There is the option there to mix a match between red and white clover. And I suppose just having seen it on the ground, um, a number of farmers have used red clover for maybe a three, four cut silage system, maybe outside blocks of ground where they don't do that much grazing and it's worked quite well. It's created a high protein feed uh, for maybe feeding on the shoulders of the year. And then your white clover then is more suitable for including in your, in your grazing mix. So on paddocks around the parlor that may be used to be grazed continuously during the summer. Um, there has been many benefits to that, which we're going to discuss now as we go on. So clover, why include it and what are the benefits? So basically the benefits so far from trials carried out in Chagas, uh, there's the potential there to fix somewhere between 150 and 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare annually. So a significant saving to be made there on chemical nitrogen. If we can fix this nitrogen from the atmosphere, it's going to and maintain our grass growth or even improve our grass growth, going to significantly reduce our nitrogen bill basically each year. Um, increased herbage production of up to 1.2 tons of dry matter per hectare. So we're all familiar, the more grass we can grow, the more profitable we will be. Uh, it allows us to feed our cows more efficiently and reduce the requirement for imported feed. So a ton of feed basically is worth 180 or 280 euros of dry matter. So we can grow an extra 1.2 tons with the same level of inputs. You know, that's 300 euros a hectare of feed there to be produced. Studies both in Clonakilty and Moorpark have showed also increased in milk solids, somewhere between 35 and 50 kilos per cow. Um, you'll say, where is this coming from? Basically, the clover is a more <clears throat> the clover is a more energy dense feed. So basically, we're getting more energy into the cows uh, as they eat it. So versus perennial ryegrass, we're getting a higher level of energy into the cows. And as a result, they're producing more kilos of milk solids. And we're also increased nitrogen use efficiency. So it doesn't come without a couple of challenges, obviously. Um, there's always going to be a downside with everything, but there is plenty of benefits. So we're just going to look here at the challenges. So I've divided into three and then I've gone into subsections basically. So grazing management issues um, is one that's been highlighted. And I suppose it's a new thing on farms with high levels of clover. And we're only coming across these issues now and trying to correct them and maybe look abroad to see what other countries are doing around this. So bloat is one of them. Um, particularly on farms that mightn't have a large volume of clover on the overall platform. So they might have receded maybe two or three paddocks and, you know, the other 80% of the farm is just straight perennial ryegrass. And what's happening there is cows are grazing for 18 or 20 days on pure perennial rye 
and then they're coming into these clover rich pastures that may have come out of bare paddocks beforehand and the result is bloat so a couple of things there that we can do to avoid that basically so introduce slowly so ideally we don't want cows going into clover rich paddocks um very hungry and um, the need to go in you know when maybe coming from a paddock or mix and match two paddocks uh, that to ensure they're not going in starved basically um, the other thing is to introduce a fiber source so a couple of options there we could have straw or hay either in the paddock or maybe in the parlor coming out and um, just to avoid bloat as best we can there is other options there around bloat oils and um, that in the drinking trough and so on and so forth um, another issue there is poor spring growth so unlike perennial ryegrass um, clover requires a warmer soil temperature before it kicks in so our grass is kicking off at six degrees so that generally happens you know february march time whereas our clover requires somewhere between nine and ten degrees before it kicks in so if we have a high volume of clover on our on, on our farm um, it can result in a lower farm cover early in the year um, particularly if, if if a lot of our paddocks are clover dominant so that's just a challenge or something that we need to be aware of. It may require us to have extra surplus bales to buffer feed at that time of the year. So as I said there, you know, the use of red clover silage could come in there in that, in that, in that time frame. Um, variation in farm growth rates. Again, this is in particular a case where, you know, some farmers might have done a proportion of their farm um, with high clover swarts and the rest with perennial rye. Um, we're seeing you know, certain percentage of the farm might be slower to get going in the spring if there's high levels of clover versus the other the other percentage of the farm. And the result then is that, you know, there might be a variation across the farm and growth rates. I suppose the big one, and it's the question that we're all wondering as how it's going to progress is the challenge over persistency. So first of all, we have to say like that there is a requirement for excellent soil fertility. So clover likes a rich swart so it likes its ph 6.3 6.5 likes high p and k and without these it's going to be very hard to persist or very hard to maintain clover in the swart so it's important that we try and correct these as best we can before we go in uh, either over sowing or sowing clover into uh, new reseeds so they don't tolerate much poaching so again it can be quite an open swart um, particularly in the spring of the year. So we need to be aware of that. And it's, you know, it's suited to dry, warmer paddocks, basically. Um, the important thing, I suppose, and it's the one where we're going to make the saving, is control levels of summer nitrogen. So at the start of the year, clover hasn't kicked in. We generally apply our nitrogen as advised. But then as the summer progresses, soil temperatures rise. This is our opportunity, basically, to save money in terms of nitrogen and allow the clover to do what it's there to do. And if we don't do this, you know, there is the risk then of the clover dying out and persistency not, not, not maintained. And I suppose it's more a point of establishment, but a clover, our grazing clover at a lower farm cover or a lower cover um, in its first three to four grazings is very important to get it established. So grazing at 800 to 900 kilos really is the target and graze it regular and get it to establish and thicken. I suppose the final challenge then is weed control post-establishment and it's been particularly uh, increased, I suppose, in the last uh, two months really with the removal of some of the products that we would have been using up until now. So our 2,4-DB products um, have gone off the market since the 31st of the 10th, 20. Now, any farmer that might have purchased these um, has until the 31st of the 10th 21 to use them so some farmers were ahead of the game and they were identifying that they were going to use clover this year and they might have purchased products in advance so that's fine and they can use them up until next october now there is a new product uh, in the making and it's hoped to be available by 2022 but i suppose a couple of things to bear in mind for farmers is that maybe they can try and remove weeds prior to receding. So if you're identifying a couple of paddocks that you might like to recede this year, you know, you can use non-clover safe sprays prior to your reseed, get the weeds out and try and establish your swart that way. 
Also, the use of uh, Roundup or, or similar products after e-seeding is very important there too. So my third topic tonight, and it's compulsory from the 1st of January 2020 again for all derogation farmers, is around the grassland management course. So all farmers have two options basically. So they either need to complete a minimum of 20 grass measurements on a suitable software program, for example, Pasture Base or Kingswood. And if they do that and they have them eligible for inspection, that's fine. The alternative is that farmers must attend the grassland management course by the 31st of December, 2021. So the plan within Chagas is that we're gonna run these courses in the spring of 2021 and farmers will be available there to take up on the course. And that basically um, keeps them eligible on this, on this measure. The fourth topic then tonight, um, and again, it's been introduced over the last basically 12 months or so, and it's been introduced gradually again, is around the crude protein reduction. So this is for all animals over two years of age on farm with 100% grass diet. And the period which it's applicable from is from the 1st of April to the 15th of September. So for 2020, the year gone by, um, any farmer in derogation had to feed a 16% maximum. That's a maximum now. So 16 down basically crude protein. And from 2021, um, that's been reduced to 15%. So again, for compliance here, farmers must have records um, of basically invoices from their, from their merchant uh, with the crude protein level stated on the invoice. And when we're doing the derogation records at the end of each year, we'll have to record this on the statements. So the fifth um, measure that I'm going to cover this evening, and we've three or four slides on this now, and it's quite new um, and it's quite topical, I suppose, at the minute. And it's highly important because it's going to be a cross compliance issue too for, for, for farmers. Um, is the prevention of direct discharge from farm roadways. And this is effective from the 1st of January, 2021. So basically there should be no direct runoff of soil water from farm roadways to waters from the 1st of January, 2021. And this applies to all holdings, regardless of derogation. And we'll mention that at the end. So just to divide it or break it up into two categories, I'm going to go with existing roadways. So the majority of farmers have the roadways in and they're wondering what are we going to do to comply with this measure now? So basically existing roadways in all cases where there is a possibility of direct runoff or soil water from a roadway to waters, the relevant section of roadway must be cambered away from the water course. So my next diagram is going to demonstrate how this is possible on, on, particular, on particular farms. So on all cases, the cross fall must be orientated away from the water. So it's of high importance that we divert the water into the field and away from the water course. So I think a picture paints a thousand words, is what to say. So I think this depicts it very well. So basically we have our existing roadway, which was flat. And basically there was a camber both ways off it. Some go into the water course and some go into the field. So for a farmer to comply with the new measures from the 1st of January, 2021, what he must do now is create a cross fall across this roadway and into the field away from the water course. He must also fence the water course or create a stock proof boundary along the, the water course side. So you can see here, there's fence posts positioned here, fence posts positioned here, and a good cross fall one is to 25 across the existing roadway. That's of high importance. So I suppose the other category then, and there will be farmers that will be extending roadways and creating new roadways. So there's a slight difference in the rules there. So in the case of a new roadway, <coughs> there must be a minimum buffer of 1.5 meters between the waterway and the roadway. And this must be fenced. So again, if we look here at this example, and um, we have our stream there on the left hand side and we created a 1.5 meter margin basically between the top of the stream and the fence post so and we've cambered this roadway from the beginning unlike the other roadway which was originally flat we've cambered this roadway from the start 
away from the river and towards the field. So that's basically what we need to be looking at when creating a new roadway along a river. And I suppose the other point to make there is we, we really only should be putting these roadways along water courses where it's unavoidable. If there's an alternative route that we can travel or create, you know, that's more desirable and try and stay away from the stream or the waterway if we can at all. So I suppose just to give um, a couple of diagrams on a standard roadway or a roadway which might be positioned away from a water course. And again, it's important here that we camber these away um, to one side and we create the water not, 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 not to be directed towards any waterway basically. There's a similar example, uh, a roadway in the center of a field. We can camber that both sides as long as there's no stream or no water course either side of that. Okay, so that's basically the first five. I'm gonna hand over now to Paddy and Paddy will continue on with the next, the next slides. And then I'll come back to you then at the end and we'll discuss how, this is, how these changes are gonna impact on farmers basically over 170, but um, not in derogation. Thank you. Thanks, Kean, in the studio there. Thanks as well, um, Kean, to any colleague there. Um, moving on from Kean there, this is a, the webinar series five, and I want to introduce myself. This is Paddy Brown, a BNT advisor in Balba Pay here. Um, and I'll just con can you continue on from Kean and the other six measures as he talked about. So. First of all, if we're talking about any kind of measures or any kind of regulation coming in, we're going to always head scratching of what's involved in it. So the first thing is, what are these new rules? And I'll be talking a bit about what they are and how to impact um, our farm or do they affect my farm? So next one is, what do they mean? And what do I have to do in terms of implement these rules and regulations? And what do I have to do going forward? Then um, what, like any kind of new rules, regulations, what will they improve? So why were they brought in? Whether they were brought in to improve water quality, biodiversity, uh, and so on. So hopefully at the end, I'll go through a bit about that. And as, as well, what do I have to do in terms of um, implementing these rules on my farm and make sure that it complained with cross complaints and inspections. So moving my outline tonight, as, as Keen says, I'll be covering set, six topics. Um, my first topic um, will be the Lyman program. So I'll talk a wee bit about that, why the Lyman program was brought in. I'll talk a wee bit about it and the benefits and also the challenges going forward. And what do I have to do in terms of the Lyman program? My second topic then will be attend a training program, a three-day training program. I'll explain what's involved in that, uh, talk a wee bit through it, and what kind of modules I'll be present in. And there's two exemptions there. I'll talk a little bit as well. I'll move on then to implement measure three, which is implement measures from the All Iron Pollinator Plan. I'll talk there what the two, the three measures are, um, and I'll talk through there and what the farmers need to be doing and complying with this measure. The fourth one is the commonage, the rough grazing exclusion from the stocking rate. I'll talk about that and where the farmer needs to set, sit down with his FOSS advisor and calculate out the stocking rate. The fifth one would be the exclusion of bovine from water courses. I'll talk about, about the, the distances and what defines a water course and the distance setback and what determines a uh, stock boot fence. And the sixth one, my final point would be the setback distance for supplementary drinking points in a field. Uh, and as, as well, again, talk about what defines a water course and the distance setback. So that's kind of my outline for the six topics. I'll go through them one per one in terms of the, the benefits and the challenges. And hopefully I'll have some take, take, take home messages at the end in terms of we'll know more about them. So going back to the first one, it's going to lame application program for the farm. Uh, it'll be for the whole farm, a calculation of the requirement for each parcel to achieve the optimum pH. So as we all know, the optimum pH is around 6.2. So 
So we're doing a, a kind of alignment program to achieve this pH for each parcel going forward. So first of all, as we look at the benefits for alignment, I know we've chatted this before, um, but it's good to get a recap there and why is important the benefits of alignment. So I stroke down a couple of points here. Uh, why do I think that alignment is, is a huge benefit? So the first one is increased phosphorus and potassium availability in the soil. If we think of the soil as an environment there, is increasing the availability of both phosphorus and potassium. Um, second one, as it will in turn improve water quality because of better phosphor utilization in the soil. The, the third one is the biological activity in the soil, to right, increase that, and in turn, this will supply, uh, improve supply of nutrients from organic matter. Just improving the, the availability of the nutrients is key in producing good grass and growing good grass. The next one is increased earthworm activity and soil structure. By increasing the earthworm activity, it'll help the soil structure and hence improve the soil drainage of the soil. So moving on to improve the persistency and competitiveness of the productive species within the sward. So if we have a sward there that has a good productive species of grass, we want to improve the persistency of that um, species and also competitiveness against other less productive species on the sward and hence push back the weeds. So increased calcium and magnesium supply for grass and in turn, this will um, increase that in livestock as well. And the last one, which is one of the most important one, is the cheapest form of fertilizer in terms of that of compound fertilizer in terms of the availability of the compound. Now, moving on, as I call it, the fertilizer plan and life cycle. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about the soil pH, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. But suppose starting off, we'll all start from the top. And the first one is the soil type. I'm not going to dwell too much on that, just to say that there's different soil types out there. And each soil type reacts differently in terms of the lining. Um, so for example, you've got your brown earth, your glaze, your pod soil. So each soil reacts differently. And it's good to know if a farmer there goes out with a spade and digs there and see the profile of a soil, which will help him going forward in terms of what soil he has and in terms of lining and fertilizer application. So starting off, what I'll think I'll do a wee bit of talking about the soil testing. So I think believe a good soil test, a good soil sample will lead to a good soil uh, sample result and hence give, give good advice in terms of lining and fertilizer advice. So I won't talk about the soil structure, but I'll talk a wee bit about the soil sampling. So the soil sampling, so the first two points there is Historically, as the area is reduced from an eight hectare for a soil sample down to a five hectare. Um, and the second one down there is the soil sample frequency from five years to four years. So you're sampling every four years. Now, a couple of points there to notice from, from the, the slides there is the soil core is take at least 20 samples per core. So you're taking that across the field in a W shape but at the same time, you're avoiding the areas that are really a compaction around feed sauce through gateways and ring feeders and stuff, et cetera. And the next one is, if we look there in the bottom right-hand corner, we see the soil sample box and it's, it's full. Now, I'm not saying that the sample has to be crushed into the box, but as long as there, there's enough cores there to fill the box as the soil, soil cores have to be dried off and then tested. Um, and if we see there as well, the, the soil cores, they're about 10 centimeters long. That gives a good representative sample of the soil in terms of your micro and major nutrients. So soil sampling, I wrote down a couple of key facts. So number one, at low cost. Uh, as I said, avoid unusual areas like feeding gateways and feeding troughs and ring feeders. So your sampling, every two to four hectares. Now that could be down to your sample different areas in terms of grazing fields, first cut silage, second cut silage, et cetera. That gets, that gets different applications of fertilizer and slurry, et cetera. So you're, as I said, you're taking about 20 cores per sample and the cores about 10 centimeters in depth. So you're filling the box, not to overfill it, and you're labeling the box correctly in terms of, you know, again, from the results come back, 
what sample is related to what field. So the funnel tillage soil samplers, I won't dwell too much on that. But, um, the P and K, so you're not sampling till at least three or six months after the last application of fertilizer or slurry or farmer in you. That gives the soil a rest uh, and you're getting a good representative sample then um, going forward and you're basing your Lyme report on that. So it's okay to sample after urea can um, and the last one not to be sampled at least two years after your last Lyme application. Give it a good clear representative sample. So that's a wee bit on soil sampling. Um, moving then to the chart here. So we picked out there to have a soil uh, pH optimum of 6.2. Why do we say that? Um, if we look here at the soil environment here between 0 to 14, 0 being acidic and 14 being alkaline. At the middle there, we're kind of what stage, um, the light green there is 6.2, that the major macro and micronutrients are more freely available to the soil. So at a range there at 6.2, the, the nutrients are available for, for the soil to uptake into the roots, etc. Once they go too acidic or alkaline, the availability comes much smaller and they're not there for the, for the root plant to take up. So we, we worked out the soil sample and the pH of the soil. So the sources of lime, what's out there in terms of we can address this pH if it's low. Um, so the first one is the calcium ground limestone. Ground limestone, as we're going to know it, is more known at 6% carbonate. So it's finely ground to react with soils. It's the most popular and it's fast acting. So it reacts once it breaks down and works out in different stages uh, for a number of years. The second one is magnesium limestone. That's 40% magnesium carbonate, 60% calcium carbonate, and it works out about 64.5 carbonate. It's a higher nutrition value. It's a wee bit slower to react, but mainly use some magnesium deficiency soils and grass tetany. So that's the two, the kind of ground limestones. The last one is the granulate limon products. So as I mentioned above, the ground limestone, the finer ground limestone, which is less than 0.15, that's the, 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 the limestone that's kind of changed over and pelleted to form the granulate limon products. So that's the case, as the faster to react, it works straight away. So for, for what is pelleted and the granulated, that's very, very fast. And a similar to fertilizer, it can be spread with your fertilizer slower um, at any time of the year. And in terms of and weather-wise, that's kind of easy spread out. Um, seasonal pH, so it's, it's a one it's a one sh one time application in terms of it only as kind of for maintenance, not for, for much for PP build up, not for um, pH build. So anything from six five point nine to six or six point one. Low pHs, you'd be going down the road of ground limestone to address that. So ground limestone means the granular lime. So ground limestone would be what you call your one-stop shop. It costs roughly around about 22 to 25 pound euro per ton, depends um, where you are. So you're five ton per hectare once every five years and depend on your soil sample. So we're addressing first when we get your soil sample results back, um, we'll know then what, how much lime is required, um, where your pH is at, and the rest in the soil. So looking there as 35%, which is less than 0.15, that's available um, straight away. Um, it works out with 350 kg, seven by staker. 20% of it is less than 0.1 millimeters, and it's finely, finely ground, and it works extremely fast. Uh, so ground lime, so it's, it's, it's cheap in the long run, um, than the granulated lime. Granulated lime, on the second hand, there is six and a half times more expensive. It's pelleted. Um, it's applied to one to one as a buildup, but uh, if, you're, if your pH is very, very low, you'd be addressing it with your granulated limestone. Granulated lime has worked for one six, as I said, and your maintenance, your plans three is the one. So your plans one and then for three consecutive years then. So whether it's more expensive um, to address pH with granular lime. So your lime, li your lime and grassland rates. So first of all, it depends on your soil pH. 
Um, so taking a good soil sample will get you a good result and then a good Lyman program then based on it. So if it comes back then at, that requires a 7.5 ton per hectare, that's your single max application. So if it comes back more than that, you're applying 50% and then the remainder in the following two years. Over Lyman is, is kind of, as reduces and locks up the major nutrients in the soil, especially pea. It also reduces minor nutrients in magnesium, copper, zinc, and boron as well. So over liming can be every bit as bad as under liming. It locks up the, the nutrients. The application window then. So people ask, when do I spread lime? You're always chatting about autumn winter period. Why? Because it allows the washing in over the winter period. So you got your chemical fertilizer and your slurry all out in your summer. You've got a rest then and the back end of the year, you're spreading your lime that washes in over the winter period. And then you're heading into next year. Spring then can be an option for farmers because low grass covers, you can spread your lime. Um, people also as well, after first or second cut silage, depending on the time where you are, weather condition, traffic ability on the ground, you can spread it after your, your first or second cut silage. So not before because it affects the silage quality, fermentation. Reseeding time is another time you're applying your lime during seed bed because you're, you're turning over soil that's poor and, and, and pH and you're putting your lime out because you're putting in high quality seed and clover and you want your soil pH to be at optimum condition. Wet soils and heavy equipment, what I mentioned there is where you are in terms of climate, weather, trackability of the soil, maybe the, the lime spreader doesn't suit that time of year or too heavy. And that's an option to look out there as well. Soil type. So what I mentioned there as earlier on in the first slide, different soil types react differently with, with lime. So what I do is a little and often approach, uh, order small quantities of lime instead of one big amount um, on it. So little and often approach, I would say there. So managing lime and high lithium soils. So soil heights less than 6.2. Quite important that local knowledge is very important in adapting lime advice. So ask around and previous experience uh, uh, is quite important. I know there's a soil map there of the high lithium areas, but previous history there is, is very important. It reduces copper uptake and also uh, seek uh, veterinary advice uh, if you think for livestock was that. Don't take your own um, guess at it. So. Um, use magnesium limestone. Uh, and if you come across there, if there's an area there of high lithium, reduce the, the application rate, adjust the lime advice by reducing it by five ton per hectare and keep soils close to 6.1. So chatting, I'll chat a wee second there quick on maintenance. So you come back there with a, with a soil sample result and pH is 6.2. So you're looking there for maintenance only. You're applying one ton per hectare of, of ground limestone. Why you mentioned there, clover there, Keen, their colleague there mentioned earlier there, that clover is works extremely well and pH is 6.2, 6.3. Um, so clover works there if you're, if you're reseeding or something like that, uh, or stitching in clover. So it's as up condition. Or you can go down the road of granular lime as a maintenance tree is the one on a single application once and then for two years after that. Um, our soil is trying to come back at six, six even. You're applying 2.5 ton per hectare. And again, you're not too far off the clover mark uh, for optimum condition. Or granular lime and a maintenance tree is the one. You can do a single or a split application there. Now, moving on to the buildup of a pH, which is getting extremely low. So your soil pH is coming in at 5.7. Is quite urgent. You're doing a single application there of applying a five ton per hectare um, now, uh, and then your soil sampling down the road again of where you're at. Um, the last one is coming in at a 5.1 soil sample, quite urgent. Um, your your advice there is 10 ton per hectare, which you're looking back there, you're, we said it's 7.5 was your max. So what you're doing there, you'll do a split. You'll, you'll do five ton per hectare now, 
and you'll apply another five tonne per hectare in two years time. So that should address the soil there. <clears throat> so moving on now to the lime and program. Um, I talked about lime there in the soil sample. So you got your good soil results and back. So you're putting them soil samples into a, a nutrient management plan and soil results. So you're basing your lime and program on a good nutrient management plan and current end date soil results. So any samples active for 2020 will be used. So just remember the soil samples uh, are only valid for four years. So it's four year duration. And the next one too is 25% of the lime spread must be spread in 2021. Go back to and the remaining then the spread the four years after afterwards. So a couple of questions that are coming in uh, asking what if the lime prior spread before 2021? So as long as they're spread post end date soil results, they'll be valid in the lime and program and the balance in the four years post 2021. Another question that was kind of kind of asked there: what about conacre? What will be included in the lime and program? So Conacre ground is taken on a one-year agreement. Um, that won't be included in the program, but any um, ground that's on more than one year. So if it's Conacre for two years or three years, it will need to be included in the program going forward. So DAF, DAF verification, you're looking for lime application for your entire farm. You want your relevant invoices to be kept on farm. So people sometimes ask as different types of lime. So each lime goes through a quality specification query. So as long as it meets the quality of SI 248 of 1978, it meets the required standards for the Department of Agriculture. Soil samples. So at the next year, so 2016 samples will be out of date. So you're looking from 2017 onwards. And the next point is, now is a great time of year for contact your soil sampler, FAST advisor, to get soil samples taken before the end of the year to avoid um, a, a lush going into the, the soil labs next year and before you're getting your slurry and fertilizer out. So take take your samples now and it's a good time you take them. Now moving on to my second point measures tonight is attend a training program. So people must participate in an approved environmental training course by the end of 2021. So it's a three-day training course and to be completed in 2020 or 2021. So not all three days have to be done together. They can be split up and the content can complete modules, but not limited these modules, but some in the lines of nutrient management planning, water quality, gases, measures, and biodiversity. There is two exemptions um, to these modules. So the first exemption is the day, day one grass, anybody that's already recording in terms of pasture base or any on, online platform gets an exemption from this. So as long as you're recording 20 grass measurements between 2020 or 2021, between uh, one measurement in February and two measurements in March, 14 in April, September, two in October and one in November, to the extent for this measure. The second exemption then is the day two fertilizer. So anybody that's completed a registered soil BP buildup course is exempt from this um, day. Uh, and the courses have been ran over the last two years. So if you completed a soil P buildup, you're exempt for day two. So the third measure then I'll talk a wee bit about is the implement measures from the All Iron Pollinator Plan. So you have to adopt at least one measure um, from the All Iron Plan. So to make the farmland more pollinator friendly and enhance the biodiversity on the farm. So the two evidence-based actions is to leave, to leave at least one mature white thorn or black thorn tree within each hedgerow. So as you're going along there, you're leaving one tree in the hedge. That's <clears throat> so they can, the, the fruit and the flower um, to increase the biodiversity. The second one then is to maintain hedgerows on a minimum three year cycle. So cutting annually stops the hedge with flower. If you're cutting all your hedges annually, you're stopped the hedge with flowering and fruiting. So you're doing it in a three year cycle. So you're cutting in rotation rather than all at once. And this will ensure some areas of hedge on the farm will always flower and increase the biodiversity of the farm. The 
The fourth one then, I'll talk about it as the commonage rough grazing exclusion. So the commonage rough grazing will not be eligible for derogation in 2020 for the calculation of chemical fertilizer allowance. It reduced the chemical fertilizer allowance on the marginal lands and hence just will reduce the risk of losses to the environment. So we're reducing the, the loss and hence you're, incre you're improving the water quality on your farm. So the um, stock and rate calculations will be at a limit of 170 and the, for the rough and then the grass tent up to 250. So what I say there is sit down with your fast advisor, uh, with, your, with your private planner and go through the calculations in time. And what we're being told is that at least 300 plus farms will be affected with this measure. So the fifth one is, <clears throat> as Keen has said there on the list, so the exclusion of bovines from water courses. So the, first of all, we're gonna, some people are asking, what defines a water course? So what we've been told is any water courses identified on the OSI, one's a 5,000 scale map, it'll be classed as a water course. So looking there on the screen there at the photograph, the, the fence is along the bank. So you're looking for a, a, a stock booth bovine ex exclusion fence one and a half meters back from the top of the bank. And that has been put by in place by the 1st of January 2021. What's been told is <clears throat> a temporary electric fence or a permanent fence is acceptable as long as, as ex, uh, stock proof and excludes bovine from entering the water course. The last one is what I was talking about as the setback distance for supplementary drinking points. So the drinking points may not be located within 20 meters of surface water from the 1st of January 2021 as well. Again, we've been told the water course is defined as being on the OSI 1 5000 map. So all water trust to be 20 meters away from water courses. And the second one, parcels that don't have 20 meters, small parcels, they have to be the furthest distance possible away from the water course. So that, that's, they have to be located on the other side of the field from the water course. So they're, they're kinda, the six points that I talked through, um, I hope they're even more clear um, and what will be here for questions and I'll pass you back to the key in there and he'll go through the, the last couple of measures. Okay, thanks Paddy. Um, thanks Ian. Okay, so I suppose just to be clear and we this is why we did it this way, we didn't want any confusion. So all of the measures, the 11 measures that we're after discussing are applicable to all farmers applying for derogation and they must comply with them all. So I suppose there's been a couple of changes uh, only in recent weeks really regarding farmers that aren't in derogation, but who are exporting slurry to keep out of derogation. So basically these are farmers that exceed 170 annually, but uh, have, a, have someone that will take slurry from them and they export slurry on paper. And as a result are brought below 170 and don't require a derogation. So, We've divided this into three categories, basically, just to be clear on it. Um, first of all, farmers with a whole farm stocking rate of 170 kilos of nitrogen per hectare prior to slurry export. So these farmers <coughs> must comply with the maximum crude protein rule, which I mentioned previously, and that's set at 15% for 2021. And they must comply with this rule going from the 1st of January 2021 must also implement a Lyman program um, as Paddy's discussed, and they must also use low emission slurry spreading equipment. So just like I explained earlier on, um, these are compulsory going forward from the 1st of January, 2021 for any farmer who is exceeding 170 on a whole farm stocking rate. Okay, if you'll just go on to the next slide, Paddy. So I suppose the second category then are farmers who have a grassland stocking rate over 170. So I suppose just to give you the definition between the two, so you might have a farmer whose whole farm stocking rate will be under 170 as he may have some tillage ground on his farm, but his grassland stocking rate is exceeding 170. So that's just a small difference, or I suppose a small difference between two types of farmers uh, mightn't be that applicable to too many, but it is there and it's just something that we need to mention. So for any farmer whose grassland stocking rate exceeds 170, but 
his overall whole firm stock and rate doesn't exceed 170, there's two additional measures which he must obey by now. So these include excluding bovines from water courses. Same rules apply as Paddy discussed, 1.5 meters from the top of the bank um, away from the water course. And I suppose the picture we put in there um, is quite relevant or quite important. So there was a bit of, a bit of confusion around whether an existing fence that was 1.5 meters away or less than 1.5 meters away was going to be allowed. So the rule has been clarified and if the existing fence is there and it's not 1.5 meters away, a new fence needs to be constructed 1.5 meters away. And the second one then is the setback distance with supplementary drinking points. So drinking troughs basically have to be moved a minimum of 20 meters away from any water course. And this applies to grassland stocking rates over the 170. And the final one there, Paddy, if you just want to move on. So this applies to all holdings, regardless of stocking rate from the 1st of January um, 2021. And that is what I spent a few minutes there discussing around the direct discharge from farm roadways. So regardless, um, if you're under 170 derogation, non-derogation, these are going to be cross compliance issues from the 1st of January 2021. And we must avoid contamination of waterways from farm roadways. And we must, as we showed with the diagrams, uh, camber roadways away from water courses to prevent runoff. And I suppose the final one, and it's only applicable to dairy cows, um, is that 85 kilos of nitrogen is going to be increased to 89 from the 1st of January 2021. Um, basically, this is a 5% increase in organic nitrogen, and that will apply to all dairy animals on the holding. And I suppose just uh, an additional point it might impact on some beef finishers is that this will apply also to any cull cows that are of dairy origin. So they're the main changes that um, we've highlighted. And I suppose we've gone through quite a bit of stuff there. So um, these slides will be available and the PowerPoint will be available. But I suppose everyone's farm is uh, different and there might be specific cases which um, may need to be discussed. So I suppose we're available in office and if uh, you can talk to your own advisor or you can talk to myself <laughs> or Paddy about these. So I'll hand it back now to Keen if he has any questions. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing there, uh, that's Paddy's, yeah, yeah. Paddy's screen. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So we're just, just looking at the questions. Actually, we had a run on questions there a while back, but maybe I'll start with some of the most recent and go back uh, and just keep an eye on the time. Um, well, what's the situation for people in this uh, with derogation for their existing fences, Kian? Uh, the existing fencing along water courses may be not in compliance with the one. Yeah, so I suppose that's been clarified in the last few days. So basically, if the fence is not is there and it is not 1.5 meters away, so they have two options. They can either remove the fence and put up a new one or they can put a new fence outside the existing fence. So that can be a temporary wire, as in just, you know, bull wire and uh, hose or um, electric wire, as long as the stock are 1.5 meters away at all times. Yeah, so they, they do need to yeah. adhere the rule one way or another. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just an interesting one there uh, about fencing the one, me one and a half meter off, particularly if, if people have a lot of water courses, do you know if that area is eligible for payment? Uh, the area inside the one yeah i would um think that that will still be eligible for payment Um, it'll still be in your mea but obviously if there's scrub or uh to develop scrub outside of the 1.5 meters that will then be excluded yeah yeah my understanding yeah. is that once it's part of an environmental program that that is still required it's still yeah, it's a landscape for, feature for yeah yeah that's fine okay um let me see uh, the question there, uh, you covered that then. So uh, whether or not people can get away with uh, what rules apply to them if they export to stay under the 170. So you've covered that section very well there at the end. And um, what is the, just a good few then to do with liming and, and the cutoff date for soil samples. So people have soil sampled maybe 15, 16, 17. What is the cutoff date then? If they're digging through the soil samples, looking at dates, seeing what's, what's eligible. Yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry, Kinder. So your cutout date there, so at the present, so your 2017 soil samples will be date. So if you go back now through your soil samples, the 2016 ones will be out of date going forward now. 
So you're looking from 2017 onwards, Kian, for soil samples. Okay, okay. And is, is there any particular date uh, in 17, you know, uh, at this stage or if people are completing plans next year? Yeah, so we've we have just a... probably started the year for 17. Uh, okay. Um, then there were a number of things then, uh, Paddy, just, uh, just to clarify and reconfirm, what, what is Conacre and what Conacre needs to be sampled? I'd just like you to reconfirm that because there were... So, so Conacre is ground that's rented for one year. Um, if you have it for one year and lose it again. So if you only have it for one year, Kian, it won't be in the Lyman program. But if it's on your BPS for a second consecutive year, it'll be calculated into your Lyman program going forward. So any okay. ground that you have for more than one year will be in the Lyman program. Okay, uh, a couple of questions then. In this Lyman plan, it's being referred to as a Lyman plan. Uh, does that get submitted to the department? The same as a nutrient management plan, glass or yeah. Uh, going back to previously, the the nutrient management plan and the glass that had to be submitted to the department separately. So yeah. as we know of now, that it won't the slime program will not be submitted. They'll be kept on farm, and it'll be available um, to the if an inspection. For um, yeah. That's that's what we're noting about be available for inspection on farm, Kian, and not to be submitted to the department. Okay, I think I think that probably covers most of them uh, most of the questions in there were a good few questions came in but they kind of surrounded and of course your two presentations actually covered them as the questions came up so i think we'll probably wrap it up we're shortly after nine o'clock we're bang on the hour and um, that's it for this evening uh, next week's webinar will cover all aspects of applying for grant aid for farm facilities uh, so if you're considering or have considered building a new shed a silage pit handling unit or making let's say, uh, safety-related changes on the farm, then you won't want to miss next week's uh, webinar. You'll find full details by following Chagask SLD, Sligo Leaf from Donegal, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. Um, and finally, uh, as I always say each week, is that uh, although through this lockdown, um, the activities have been much restricted, is that you can always contact your Chagas advisor by phone, text, and email. Many thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, stay safe and good night.